Well, good morning, Stoke Coast. Uh, I'm Jonathan. I'm, I'm super excited about this, uh, this teaching today because uh, the book of Ruth is, is actually one of my favorite books in the Bible, uh, certainly in the Old Testament. Uh, and if you haven't already taken time to do so, it only takes about 20 or 30 minutes to read all the way through. It's a, it's a very short book, and I highly encourage you uh, to do so. And we're, we're closing up a series uh, on the book of Ruth called Finding God in the Ordinary. It's a Craig Rochelle uh, series, and, and it really is about not only finding him do, working in the ordinary, but it's also doing the ordinary things that bless and serve others. And we've talked about uh, Ruth and Boaz and Naomi uh, throughout. And so today, uh, instead of the, the, the theme which, which we've been on is about those relationships and, and speaking to people that are, are seeking or, or in relationship, uh, even though I love this story because it's one of the greatest human love stories in, 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 the, in the Bible, Today, I'm going to do something a little bit different. And today, I really want to speak to those of you who are maybe disappointed with, with where you find yourself today. In this season of your life, maybe you, you don't believe in the goodness of God. And it's not that you don't maybe believe it, but it's, it's maybe you don't see it happening every day. And perhaps you hope that you'd be you know, financially strong in this time, where you'd be able to, to bless others with that, but you don't really know how you're going to make ends meet at the end of the month. Or perhaps you've dreamed of a God-honoring marriage, and for whatever reason, that dream has been put on hold, or worse, it's become something of a nightmare. Maybe in this time, you thought you'd be happy and successful and, and active in a, in a ministry area someplace. But instead, you find yourself lonely or anxious or depressed. And if you're hurting, hopeless, or, or even just hoping for something better right now, I want you to know that I'm sorry. And my heart hurts for you. And I get it. But most importantly, I, I pray that God gives you hope through this message today and, and through this series that he has a plan for you, for this journey that you're on. And it is a journey, and it's not over. See, the book of Ruth, as we've gone through the last four weeks, it showcases a journey, both a balance of what's happening in their lives, but you see what's happening in the life of Ruth in particular as our primary protagonist going through this. And uh, can you flip the slide up, please? In chapter one, you know, Naomi and Ruth, they hit rock bottom. Both of them have lost their husbands. They've been widowed. They had no jobs. They had no prospects for financial stability or provision. And they were seemingly without hope while they were away in Moab. And so I think we can all relate in some ways to Ruth's experience of heartbreak or loss, the pain that she was feeling. But Ruth makes one critical decision there in chapter 1, which we covered. As a young widow, she leaves the sinfulness of Moab and pursues the one true God in Bethlehem. And that amazing line of, don't tell me to go away. Where you go, I will go. Where you stay, I will stay. Your people will be my people, and your God will be my God. And with that decision, it changes her life. And in chapter 2, you see that she works and she waits and she serves Naomi faithfully. She just so happens to be gleaning in a field and just so happens to meet a guy named Boaz, a godly man, a, a, an honorable man, a man of character, who invites her to a lunch date, which is pretty cool. But then something happens and nothing happens, right, after the lunch date. And so there's time. And so, so in chapter 3, we see, uh, as we've talked about, she initiates. She's very forward. She goes and, and stays at the foot of his bed. I mean, like, this is the uh, we don't recommend doing this in premarital counseling type of a thing, like uh, dating today. Maybe don't just show up to a guy's uh, bed and be like, hey, I'm here, uh, right? Uh, but she does initiate. She, she goes forward. And then she surrenders. And then she trusts. She surrenders herself to a godly man of character. And she says, remember me. And she asks Boaz to cover her and protect her. And then she trusts and waits that he will be her kinsman redeemer, which we talked about last week, two, or two weeks ago. And then in chapter 4, 
We, uh, we saw, and we'll talk about it a little bit more today, she's redeemed, she's, resto- she's restored, and the family's restored, and the community is rejoicing. Boaz rege- redeems her. He marries her. They have a son together named Obed. Uh, and the, the community recognizes this and rejoices in God's providence. It's awesome. But I remember being stuck in chapter 1, and many of you may feel that way. And so if you feel that way today, here or online, I want to tell you right now that God sees you, he cares for you, he loves you, and he has a plan for you. And if you're on a hold and you're waiting in chapter 2, remember that God is working and he is faithful, so trust him and wait on him. And in chapter 3, continue to trust God as you see his providence starting to work in your life. And in chapter 4, I pray today that you discover that God's plans are good and that they're better than you can imagine, which is the title of the rest of the sermon. So I pray today, Lord, we pray for all those who may be disappointed in their current chapter. And God, we would all find you and experience you and know you and ultimately be changed by you. In your holy name, amen. Now, before we have a Bible reading uh, today from Ruth 4, I want you to understand that, you know, I'm not coming from like someone just telling you that this is the way it should be, but I've experienced this and experienced it now. And some of you may find yourself in any of these chapters, or you may find yourself in chapter three and then suddenly find yourself back in chapter one and it happens to all of us. You know, many of you recently uh, helped us uh, as we talked about serving weekend as we moved uh, from house to house. I mean, it was like 24 folks or something like that from this church uh, pitched in. It was amazing. It's something I've never seen before in my life. And uh, especially to our community group uh, who showed up day in and day out to help us in all kinds of ways, not just physically, but just with encouragement or a meal or to be there for us. I mean, I think Scott actually moved one third of my house by himself. It was like <laughs> awesome. Like he's not here today because he's still injured, right? Uh, but what, what many of you don't know is that a week before that happened, I found myself in the hospital for an entire day where I'd lost feeling in my left hand, uh, left arm, and, and it was numb and painful. And uh, it's not life-threatening, uh, but, but this injury in particular, it, it does drastically change the thoughts and plans I had for my future. Uh, as, a, as an Air Force officer uh, and, a, and, a, and a, uh, a pilot, a flyer, you know, it, it changes the role I thought I had in the Air Force and the career and, and that secondary identity of who I thought I was. I, I had these, this idea of what's going to happen over the next few years and, and where my family could live and, and the roles I'd find myself in. And this injury may absolutely change all of that. And, and so it's important to remember that the chapter you find yourself in today, it's not a linear chapter where we're going to just move on through this. Right? And as we unpack the sermon today, like I'm, I'm right there with you, not knowing. But Psalm 27, 14 says, wait on the Lord and be strong and take heart. And I don't know what my future will hold, just as you don't either, but I'm confident in who holds that future. And it can be good and better than we can ever imagine. If you could come up, please, Stephen, to read the... Uh, Please stand as you're able for the uh, reading of God's Word. Ruth 4, 11 through 17. Then the elders and all the people at the gate said, We are witness. May the Lord make the woman who is coming into your home like Rachel and Leah, who together built up the family of Israel. May you have standing in Ephrathah and be famous in Bethlehem. Through the offspring the Lord gives you by this young woman, May your family be like that of Perez, whom Tamar bore to Judah. So Boaz took Ruth, and she became his wife. When he made love to her, the Lord enabled her to conceive, and she gave birth to a son. The women said to Naomi, Praise be to the Lord, who this day has not left you without a guardian redeemer. May he become famous throughout Israel. 
He will renew your life and sustain you in your old age. For your daughter-in-law, who loves you and who is better to you than seven sons, has given him birth. Then Naomi took the child in her arms and cared for him. The women living there said, Naomi has a son, and they named him Obed. He was the father of Jesse, the father of David. May God bless the reading, hearing, and doing of his word. Amen. So last week, we talked briefly about Boaz being a kinsman redeemer. Uh, And at the beginning of chapter 4, just before these verses, Boaz goes and meets with a close relative. He's closer in relative relation to Naomi. uh, And and culturally speaking, that other guy, unnamed guy, is the one who's supposed to be the kinsman redeemer and take care of Naomi and and, and Ruth. And he's really interested in doing so, uh, right, at first. But it's important to note here that Boaz is a man of character. He followed God's commands to, to take care of the poor, right, back in chapter 2, and to take care of widows. And then he followed the cultural expectations of, of yes, the kinsman redeemer. We have to take care of these folks. Well, it helps that he's pretty interested in Ruth at this point, right? <laughs> but, uh, it, but he's doing it the right way. He goes and meets with this guy at the gate in order to, to, to truly make a deal. Well, that other guy... He was interested in, in the land, right, the property, that stuff that came with it, but not when he found out that the, the cultural cost of this, of marrying a foreigner, Ruth, to do it. No way, Jose. Thank you very much. All yours, Boaz. And then Boaz steps up, and he marries Ruth as a kinsman and redeemer who provides and protects for her. And then you have the elders praying this blessing. Right here, the most practical piece of advice I'm going to give you during this sermon is right now. There is power in prayer. Thank you. Amen. I love it. And here's the practical side of it. We're often enabled and empowered to be the answer to those prayers, not only others' prayers, but the prayers that we ourselves are saying. Just as you, Stone Coast, served and loved others this morning down at Matheson Street Church, you, in, in how you've heard us talk about the, the importance of, of helping those in need or praying for those who are afflicted by homelessness and then doing something about it, you can do this in every little way in your life. And there's prayer examples throughout the book of Ruth. If you could pull up the slide there. Like an example right at the beginning in chapter one, Naomi says, may the Lord give you a husband. And then later on, she plays matchmaker. Obviously very well, right? Take some notes on that one. Ruth uh, then later says, may the Lord deal with me if I ever leave you uh, in uh, 117 when she's talking to Naomi. But then she answered that prayer, and she was faithful. She served Naomi throughout the rest of this and throughout the rest of her life. Boaz said, may the Lord be with you uh, to uh, those who worked in his fields. But then he took care of them. He provided them lunch. And then the workers responded, may the Lord bless you. And then they blessed him by working hard in the fields and making him a wealthy uh, man and taking care of the things that he put them in charge of. Then Boaz later in chapter 2 said, May the Lord repay and bless you to uh, to Ruth. Immediately following that, he invited her on that awesome date lunch, and then he told his workers to provide for her. It's not just let her glean in the fields, but leave things for her, uh, help her, protect her, guide her. He answered his own prayer immediately. Ruth later says, may I continue to find favor in your eyes. And uh, Naomi says, may the Lord bless the man who blessed you. And Boaz at the end of chapter, or middle of chapter three said, may the Lord bless you. And then he continued to bless Ruth, ultimately by marrying her as we see right here in this chapter. You can be the answer to the prayers that you make and let God work through you to bless others. As the elders prayed, this one prayer is super important to see the impacts in the rest of the story. They pray, may the Lord make Ruth like the woman from whom the whole nation of Israel descended. May you prosper and be famous in Bethlehem. That's a paraphrase, probably what you see on there. That one prayer absolutely changed a life, and it changed a family. And it changed a legacy that still impacts us here today. One prayer. So never underestimate the power of what God can do responding in prayer. 
And so some of you who are feeling stuck right now in chapter one or you're waiting in chapter two, you might just be one prayer away from the blessing that God wants to bring into your life. Come back to that at the end. We see the answer to prayer, this particular prayer, in Ruth chapter uh, 4, uh, verse 13. So Boaz took Ruth into his home, and she became his wife. He slept with her, and the Lord enabled, which is key, her to become pregnant, and she gave birth to a son. Now, I didn't want to feel left out. Over the last four weeks, I know that Chuck and Sean like to come up here and talk to you about uh, and find ways to say sex in church, right? <laughs> I, like, so I had to go ahead and keep going with the theme of the series, right? And I want to be really specific with everyone in here that uh, this uh, particular verse is not referring to virgin birth, okay? So this is, there you go, check, uh, <laughs> I met it. But the other really important thing to take out of this verse is it's the answer to one prayer, but it clearly demonstrates how God can sometimes take years upon years to move us from one of these chapters to another. But he has blessings on the far end, which is this. You remember that Ruth and Naomi were in Moab for 10 years in misery as they lost their families and they had no provision. And yet that one decision to leave Moab and head back to Bethlehem and seek the one true God in Israel results in that changed life, that changed family, and ultimately the changed legacy with the praise coming from the entire community of God's provision. You see, God is able. So the Lord enabled there in Ruth 13 it's actually a really cool phrase. Uh, I, I know our community group talked about it. In the Blue Level Letter Bible, it's an app. Uh, you can pick out uh, a, a phrase or a, a verse and then see all of the different translations because there are lots of different translations uh, of Hebrew words uh, some uh, ways. If you can bring up the, the next slide, I'm going to slaughter this because I am not a Hebrew speaker. But uh, that in Hebrew, that phrase, it's Yahweh weyitin. Uh, and I might have actually just said that correctly, right? And, and depending on how you, uh, you translate that, and there's all these different translations, and here's just a few of them, it, it means a little bit different uh, in each of these verbs, right? In the NIV, it's the Lord enabled. And then in the ESV, the Lord gave. In the CSB, the Lord granted. In the GNT, the Lord blessed. So he enabled, he gave, he granted, he blessed. It's all of these verbs about the things that God can do because he is able, right? And maybe in your particular situation, it's a wholly different verb that you're looking for and that he is possible. Possibly, and he is able to do. The Lord provided. The Lord healed. The Lord answered. Maybe the Lord restored. The opened a door. He proved himself faithful in that thing that you want him to do. He's made a way for you. And you are now living as an example of the way that the Lord has changed, the, changed your circumstances and brought you to a place that was better than you ever could imagine. And you're shining as a light of hope for all those who have yet to walk through that. So whatever you're facing, if you haven't walked through it, I want you to hear right now that God is able. And he's able to do more than we can imagine. Because in Ephesians 3.20, if you can switch this slide, now to God who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine, according to his power that is work within us. So what can God do? Whatever you need his provision. What can God do? More than you can imagine as he works his purpose through your life. And I know what some of you are thinking because it's the exact same thing that I was thinking and many times in my life. And the first thing that many of us think is, well, if he can, then why hasn't he? If he, if he could, then why doesn't he do it now on my time? And I'd imagine that's probably the same thing that Ruth was thinking in her 10 years in Moab or, or even in that secondary chapter where she said, well, your God will be my God. Well, why doesn't he do something? You, you just introduced me to this awesome guy named Boaz, right? It was a great lunch, and then I got nothing, right? I thought you were supposed to be this awesome, amazing God. Instead, you know, I, I, I turned to you. I stuck with grumpy old Naomi, who calls herself Mara now. She's not even going by her own name because she's so upset about stuff, right? My sister-in-law bounced out of this relationship. I'm all by myself. I'm working hard every single day. 
you know, trying to work so we don't starve. But you know, the really cool thing about Ruth is that even if she was thinking all those things, you can see by her actions through the book of Ruth that she continued every day to work and trust that God was able. And so while you're waiting on God to show you what he's done, while you're waiting, remember that he is working. Keep the faith just like Ruth did. She never let her current circumstances or situation define her view of God or define the relationship that uh, Sean talked about in week two of this. She trusted that God is able and he has the power to overcome every problem that you face And because God answers prayers, he blesses abundantly, he comforts, he delivers, he empowers, he forgives all of our sins through the precious blood of Jesus Christ who died on a cross for every single one of you, every single one of us who trusts and believes in him. I could go through the whole alphabet. I won't, right, uh, in the uh, case of time, about all these things that God is able to do, but I'm telling you that he is more powerful than we can imagine and your future can hold things that you can't even imagine. But if you switch the slide up to Ruth 14 and 15, uh, please. I think it's also important to recognize that the end of this, this, all this rejoicing that's coming from the community, the praise as, as you see uh, the families around uh, it, on the things that God can do, First, it's not about just being wealthy or having like all of these, the things of this world. I mean, this isn't uh, about that. Instead, you can see it very clearly in these as the, uh, the women in the town says, praise the Lord who has now provided a redeemer for your family. They're talking about the provision of family, of relationships, of the legacy that's going to ultimately change the entire world because God's provided a life in Obed. The name means servant of God. So they're praising God for his provision. And as great as this is, it, out of context of what was going on in chapter 1, like this, this loses something, loses some of its shine. Because in chapter 1, if you go back, you remember this is not Naomi's first plan. Like she didn't want to go off to Moab with her, uh, with her husband potentially, right? She definitely didn't want her husband just to leave her there while he died, Right? And then uh, for her children uh, to pass away uh, and to find herself destitute, that was not plan A. Right? This wasn't Ruth's plan A either. Right? So she was uh, previously married uh, and uh, d- did not have children uh, with, that, uh, with that other guy. So this is not plan A. It might be plan B. And many of you may be in a plan B in your life right now or plan C or D or E or F or wherever you happen to find yourself. But that doesn't mean that God's not still working through all of these. And if you're not somewhere that you thought you'd planned, or you look ahead and you no longer can see the plan that makes sense for you, recognize that God's plan is better, and it could be more and better than you can imagine. Reference back to my own life again, and I think back 25 years ago when I was in college, I wanted to be a doctor. I'm not a doctor today. Clearly, there's a different plan, all right? So we're at least at B, uh, just at this story, right? And, uh, and, and in order to pay for college, I, I joined the Air Force ROTC, and they had a certain like, level of uh, grades that you have to be uh, and, uh, to, in order for them to let you pursue medical school. And they, they were like, hey, man, uh, yeah, you are too dumb to be a doctor. Uh, would you like to fly airplanes instead? I was like, yeah, you, you bet. Tells you a lot about the pilots that you have flying around the country, by the way, uh, uh, on that note. Uh, so I, I went, I was like, that sounds like a great plan, you know, a plan B. Uh, cool, I'll do that. Uh, and then I go off to pilot training, and I've, I've mentioned this before and here before, but I failed out of pilot training uh, as well. And I'm like, that's not good. And at that time, they were like kicking people out of the Air Force. And, and thankfully, through, through a, a number of circumstances, it just so happened that I found myself a different kind of aircrew member, uh, a, a Wizzo is what we call them, but, uh, and flying a jet that's awesome, an F-15E. Like, I never would have expected these things, uh, right? And, and then later on in my career, because I was flying the F-15E, like, there was a chance that I could go off and, and be an exchange officer in Australia. Like, oh, cool opportunities, right? That some of these things never happened. But I ultimately had a pretty good career. Right, and, I, I, and a great one. So even though I, I don't know what's next, 
you know, and I, I go from being where I think is a chapter four in this, and maybe back to a chapter two or a three, because I, I still can't feel parts of my hand and stuff. I, you know, I, I, I'm okay, because I have this to reference back on. But, but way more important than a career is relationships and the relationships of what happened. Because by changing my major, I just so happened to meet Erin and become friends with her. And then by failing out of pilot training, I just so happened to have time to call her on the phone and do some long distance dating uh, and stuff. And then by flying F-15s, I, I, I just so happened to live close to her, which resulted in a marriage and two awesome children that I love dearly. And by not going to Australia, even though we had orders in hand and we thought that was going to be like a lifelong dream. Just so happened that I met some Christian missionaries and counselors that helped us through the lowest points of our marriage when we thought maybe it was the end. And more importantly, it just so happened to find a deep personal relationship with Jesus Christ. And it changed the direction of my life completely. I wanted something totally different time and time again. And yet God's plan was infinitely better than I could imagine. So maybe you feel like you used to be in chapter four and now you're in two or three or back at one. God is still working for something infinitely better than you can imagine. So if you don't get the job you want, God's got something better. If you didn't get a chance to marry that person that you thought you did, God's got someone better, not that fixer-upper. <laughs> no. If, Neil, if you, to tell you a joke. Uh, <laughs> he's like, nope. <laughs> if you had different plans for what you're going to do this weekend, and you find yourself in a situation that you can love and serve others in some way that you're like, I don't know how this impacts it. God may use that for infinitely better things than even you can imagine. Ruth uh, 4.17, if you bring that slide up. The neighbor women said, now at last Naomi has a son again. And they named him Obed. And he became the father of Jesse and the grandfather of David. The series has been about finding God in the ordinary beyond the hanky-panky that everyone wants to talk about up here uh, all the time. (laughs) Finding God in the ordinary is about seeing the providence of God. Providence of God is when God uses these natural circumstances to bring about his supernatural will. And sometimes we can't see it until we're at the end. You know, the Hebrew language is one that you read from backwards to, to front, and that's because it's really easy to find out where you're going if you already know the end state. Uh, right? And, and in English, we don't do that. we all over the place. Uh, you know, probably like uh, some of you are listening to me right now. But uh, remember that at the end of this, it's important who Obed was and where we're going with this. Because God is blessing through this lineage and this relationship us today. See, Jesus was born from the lineage of Ruth. She wasn't a perfect person. She's a Moabite woman. Right, and the Moabites, if you didn't know, uh, or if, I don't remember if we mentioned this before, but they served other gods, and not just served other gods like demons. They sacrificed children on altars to these gods. And this is where Ruth is coming from when she leaves Moab. So think about it. It's not her plan A. It's not the things that she did, and it's not the circumstances that she was from, right? But God can work all of this for good. He provided a me- meaningful relationships for her. He redeemed her through Boaz. He blessed Naomi through her. He provided the savior of the world through her for us. Their child Obed was the grandfather of David, and 28 generations later Jesus was born. So if you wake up somewhere in life that you didn't want to be, whether you're hurting like in chapter one or you are waiting in chapter two, just like you're waiting for me to get to the point uh, at the end of this day, remember that God is working in all of it.
and God has something better than you can imagine. You know, the characters in the book of Ruth, and I, I do encourage you to read it all, like they, they may talk about God, but this is a, a, a one of the books in the Old Testament where the narrator never, ever refers to God acting in some bold way, some miraculous way, you know, like the parting of the Red Sea type of a way, the speaking from a burning bush or hollering from the top of a mountain or like chariots of fire type of miracles. Instead, God acts through ordinary people like you and I. Not only to bless them in the circumstances they find themselves in, but weave items together so that through their legacy, we can be blessed and saved today. Romans 8.28, it says, We know that God causes everything to work together for the good of those who love him and are called together for his purpose. He redeemed a person in Ruth, and he redeemed a family to include Naomi and Boaz, and he provided a savior for us all through their story. And it's a cool story. It's a redemption story. It's, the, it's one of the coolest things about this story, about redemption, is that Ruth and her identity, coming from that Moabite woman, that being uh, from where she was from, changed throughout the, the, the rest of this story. How she saw herself was strengthened and improved through the presence of a living and loving God. And the closer she got to God, the more that changed. Can you pull up the last slide, uh, or second to last slide? Early in uh, the story, Ruth, uh, I'm not going to try all these Hebrew words. If you're interested, we can work this together afterward. But uh, in uh, chapter 2, she refers to herself as a foreigner. And this is why you have to read the whole story. You have to see what she says about herself, right? She's identifying as someone who is a part, a stranger. She's lost. She's broken. She's not even, uh, she was in Moab, and, and, and now she's in this place with no one that, around that likes her, uh, other than potentially old cranky Naomi, right? <laughs> And then when she first meets Boaz, right, she's thinking of any other guy out there. She refers to herself as lower than his servants, right? She is not worthy. She's a sinner. And remember, that's after she chose. She made the decision to choose and pursue our God. And then Boaz loves her, and in chapter 3, he, he saves her, uh, or he's, uh, he's looking to, to take care of her, and she refers to herself as a servant. So you can see how it's improving on itself. And then lastly, in chapter 4, she sees herself, this is the best part, right? Like, not, after he's redeemed her, it's not just as a slave, or not just as a servant, or as like a, a someone else, right? She's his wife, a family member. And so if you are in Christ... If you've accepted him as Lord and Savior, this is your redemptive story as well. Once God probably felt far away from you, and you felt like a spiritual outsider or lost and broken like she did, right? You were hurting or broken or helpless in something that was a struggle, right? And God had something better than you could ever imagine. He sent his son, Jesus Christ, to love you and save you and redeem you. Ephesians 2.11 said, don't forget that you Gentiles used to be outsiders. In those days, you were living apart from Christ, in a world without God and without hope. But now you have been united with Christ Jesus. Once you were far away from God, but now you have brought near to him through the blood of Christ. So now you Gentiles are no longer strangers and foreigners. You are citizens along with all of God's holy people. You are members of God's family. When you say yes to Christ, you are not a foreigner. You're family. You're the bride of Christ, the child of a living God. You are heir to his kingdom. So remember to keep pursuing God no matter which chapter you find yourself in because God is able. And while you're waiting for him to work, remember he is working. We're waiting for him to show us what's happening. He is working. And in the midst of your pain or your second choices or wherever you happen to be, God's plans are infinitely better than we can possibly imagine because there is a chapter four for each and every one of us who says yes to following Christ. And one day, you'll look backwards and you're going to see God's providence woven throughout your entire life. And you'll remember a good God who never left you, a 
and was with you even right now, wherever you find yourself. Just like Ruth, it takes one decision to follow Christ and allow him to change your life. We started this series coming out of the book of Judges where it ends with people did what they thought was right in their own eyes. And it's the decision instead to say, I want to do what's right by what you say, Lord, that changes us. Bow your head in prayer. Lord, thank you for showing us through the book of Ruth and working through her life and the lives of everyone that we've read about over the past few weeks, that you wove amazing and yet small circumstances to affect us here today and bring us Christ Jesus. Thank you, Lord, that you made a way. And for each and every one of us, because we always need this reminder, wherever we are. If we choose to follow you each and every day, Lord, you are making a way. So we trust you in this. May we patiently wait as you work. And for those who've never said, uh, never trusted you with that, I uh, pray that they hear you calling. And for those of us who've done it a thousand times, may we repeat like we should every single day, just, Lord, you are all I need. Lord, I'm tired of doing it my own way. I lay down my life and give it to you. I'm a sinner, and I need you as Lord of my life. Lord, may you make a way. Take me away from this Moab that I find myself in chapter one. Walk me through the waiting of chapter two. Show me your hand at work in the lives of those around me in chapter 3 and bring me to this future that I know you have for me because you died on that cross for me and you've made a way for me to be with you in heaven and work through me to bring your glory into this world. And I thank you for it, Lord. Thank you for an opportunity to be part of that bigger story. May we love and serve others so that all may find full life in Christ Jesus. In your name we pray.